and understandably it caused great anxiety to Amundsen's wife and family. So uh, on one occasion, out of great concern for them, Amundsen took a homing pigeon with him. And uh, when he finally reached the North Pole, he opened the bird's cage and set it loose. And very shortly afterwards, the pigeon arrived at Amundsen's home in Norway. And uh, when she saw the pigeon, Amundsen's wife knew exactly what it meant. And she cried out, He's alive! He's alive! I start with that because the night before the Lord Jesus died, Jesus told his disciples he was going to be leaving them, returning to the right hand of the Father. But at the same time, he made them a solemn promise. He said this, When I get there, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counsellor to be with you forever, the spirit of truth. Now, our passage this morning describes the fulfilment of that marvellous promise. Uh, The Holy Spirit, the spirit of truth, comes down from heaven, and immediately the disciples know that although Jesus is no longer with them physically, nevertheless, he's alive at the right hand of the Father in heaven. And of course, we know that too. But this unique event also speaks powerfully to us in another way this morning. Uh, In our series, we're trying to answer the question, why church? I mean, why get up earlier than you probably want to on a Sunday morning to come to St. Barnabas and do churchy things with people that are very different to you. I mean, why not have an extra hour in bed and then when you get up, just listen to John Piper on the internet or whoever it is? The answer to that question is that the church is right at the center of God's plan to remake a broken world. And for a start, it's the community of those people who've recognized that they are broken and need a doctor and that there's only one doctor who can heal them. And once they have been healed, they've found that life is different. Uh, They've got new appetites they didn't have before. Uh, They've got new priorities. One of those appetites is a hunger for fellowship with people who've had the same experience. And of course, the obvious place where that fellowship can be found is among those people who gather week by week at the foot of the cross in the fellowship of a local church. But the local church is actually about a great deal more than merely the fellowship of its members. That's vitally important. It's what keeps us going, actually, as Christian people in a messed up world. But the local church also has a crucial role to play in God's plan for the entire world. And that's the focus of the passage we're looking at together this morning and the extraordinary events that took place on the day of Pentecost. Before we come to the text, I want to invite you to think about this. Um, As you know, our quest to understand what the church is all about has brought us on a tour through the whole of the Bible. And I think you probably noticed by now that we've made some very long journeys between stops. So the journey from creation to Babel took thousands of years. From Babel to Mount Sinai, well, that was many hundreds of years. And last week, our journey from Sinai to the cross, well, that was also hundreds and hundreds of years, probably 1,400 years. But this week, our journey from the cross to Pentecost 50 days. That's all it is. It's only seven weeks since Jesus died on the cross. And that tells us, I think, that there must be a link between the cross and the coming of the Holy Spirit. What is that link? 
Well, there's a place in the Gospel of John where Jesus says that believers will have streams of living water flowing from within them. And uh, in that passage, John explains what Jesus meant, and this is what he says. By this, by the living waters, Jesus meant the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time, the Spirit had not been given because Jesus had not yet been glorified. Now, when John talks about Jesus being glorified, he's talking about his death on the cross. And what John is telling us here is so, it's so awesome that it should actually cause all of us this morning to pause in reverence and wonder. Because, you see, the reason the Spirit could not be given until Jesus died for sinners is that if God came into an unclean, unforgiven human heart, he would destroy us. Why? Because he's the spirit of God. He's the spirit of God's all-consuming holiness. And we've seen in previous studies that the Bible says our God is a consuming fire. And the holiness of God would destroy us unless our sin is first cleansed at the cross. So can you see, my friend, this morning that it is not a small thing to have the Holy Spirit in your heart? Jesus had to die to make that possible. It's an awesome privilege to have the Spirit living within us. So as we look at the coming of the Spirit at Pentecost, we ought to come to this text in a spirit of great reverence and humility. And I'm going to approach it this morning under just two headings. First, we're going to look at the miracle of Pentecost. What sort of miracle was it? And then we're going to look at the meaning of Pentecost. So first then, the miracle of Pentecost, and here we're in verses 1 to 13. Interesting detail, please notice that these astonishing events took place when the disciples were assembled. Verse 1, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. So they hadn't stayed in their various homes, scattered around Jerusalem, they'd gathered together. And we know from Chapter 1, verse 15, that the number of believers at that time was about 120. So this gathering was, I guess, what today we would describe as a medium-sized church. And it was when they had all assembled together, and not until then, that God came down. Verse 2, suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven, and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. Now, read that text carefully. Notice there was no wind, just the sound of a violent wind. There was no fire, just something that looked like fire. It must have been terrifying. I mean, imagine for a moment the noise of a hurricane or a tornado, but with none of the effects. No trees being blown over, no roofs being ripped off. And imagine the sight of something that looks like fire, but with no heat. Nothing is getting consumed or burned up. Just tongues of fire separating, coming to rest on individual people. But dramatic as all of that is, the main focus is not actually the audiovisual experience. No, the main focus is verse 4. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. We looked at this last time, but in case you've forgotten, it is true that elsewhere the word tongue is used to describe ecstatic speech 
That's 1 Corinthians 14. That cannot possibly be the meaning here. Because in verses 5 to 11, we're told that the people in the crowd were from every nation under heaven. And each one heard the disciples speaking in their own language. So, the miracle of Pentecost, this is what it is, is a miracle of speaking. Uh, The disciples haven't been to university to study languages. They haven't been having secret language tutorials. The Spirit descends, and every disciple starts speaking in languages they haven't spoken before. Now, what on earth does that all mean? Well, think about the crowd for a moment. In verse 5, we're told that they were God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. So there were pilgrims who'd gathered in Jerusalem for the great Jewish feast of Pentecost. And Pentecost was one of three great festivals in the Jewish calendar. First was Passover, then 50 days later, which is the meaning of the word pente, 50 days later, Pentecost. And at Pentecost, the Jews celebrated two things. First, they celebrated the giving of the law to Israel at Mount Sinai. Do you remember that extraordinary event that we looked at here together a fortnight ago when God said to Moses, assemble the people before me to hear my words. And I think it's rather wonderful that God chose this particular day to celebrate the giving of the gospel, not just to Israel, but to the whole world. Then second, Pentecost was their harvest festival. A time of great joy and thanksgiving as the sheaves of the harvest were gathered in. And Pentecost provided a wonderful picture of the fact that later, that very same day, there was going to be a miraculous harvest of 3,000 souls. But in the excitement of it all, uh, these Jewish pilgrims, well, they don't don't really know what to make of it. Just look with me at verse 7. Utterly amazed, they asked, are not all these men who are speaking Galileans? How is it that each of us hears them in his own native language? Now, why are they talking about the disciples like that? Well, Galileans were actually provincial folk. Uh, They were not uh, sophisticated city dwellers. Uh, They spoke with a very strong regional accent that was difficult, actually, even for their fellow countrymen to understand. Um, I wouldn't want to hazard a guess at what the equivalent would be here in South Africa, but if you were to come with me, or perhaps with Ian, to the United Kingdom, to a city like Newcastle, uh, or to Liverpool, or to Glasgow, you would find it extremely hard to understand what the locals were saying. Technically, they would be speaking English. But the combination, you see, of a very strong local accent with some words that they only use in those particular cities means you wouldn't have a clue what they were actually talking about. Am I right, Ian? I am, yes. Now that is the background here. The Galileans were looked down on by the most sophisticated people from Judea and Cappadocia and Pontus. Uh, As far as they were concerned, a Galilean was a bit of a country bumpkin, couldn't talk properly, even in his mother tongue. And yet, here he was, standing up, filled with the Holy Spirit, speaking in languages he could not possibly have learned for himself, and declaring the wonders of God. Now that means, friends, that the coming of the Spirit at Pentecost signifies the start of a new age in God's dealings with humanity. It's the age when the gospel is going to be proclaimed to all nations. 
And of course, it doesn't mean that because we might have the Holy Spirit that we should expect to start speaking foreign languages without any homework. Now, those of you studying Greek and Hebrew at the college might be hoping for that, but that is not the meaning of Pentecost. The point of Pentecost is that we've entered a new age, now listen to me carefully, in which the Holy Spirit empowers God's people to speak God's word throughout God's world. That is the meaning of Pentecost. Now, if you think about it, that's actually what's happened, isn't it? Uh, If you go to uh, Operation World, go to their website, uh, you will find that today some portion, maybe not very much, some portion of the scriptures has now been published in 2,500 languages, which means that 95% of the world's population have the gospel in their own tongue. They might not actually have access to it for one reason or another, but it's in their tongue. And it all started here. And please, will you notice how it starts? It's really important. In verse 14, Peter stands up to speak to this vast crowd of people from every nation under heaven. And the rest of the chapter, the rest of of chapter 2 is what? What is it? It's a sermon. Oh dear. It's Bible teaching. It's word ministry. Now look, our generation of Christians might want something different. Maybe a film or a concert. But that's not what we've got here. It's Bible teaching. And the result is beyond all human expectation. 3,000 people converted. Now, let's put this in context. Do you remember that at Babel, God confused human language? And it was an act of divine judgment on pride. And the result was that humanity was scattered. And ever since the Tower of Babel, men and women have been separated from God, separated from one another. But here, the Holy Spirit comes down from heaven and people from every nation are gathered into a new community that's been reconciled to God through the gospel. And that, my friends, is why ever since the church has seen the blessing of Pentecost as the deliberate and very dramatic reversal of the curse of Babel and the means that God uses to transmit this blessing to people from all nations is Bible teaching. It is word ministry. So when these folks get converted, what is their top priority? Come with me to verse 42. Verse 42, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Well, of course they did. That's how they were converted. So now they want more of it. And it's really important, I can't emphasize this too strongly, it's really important to see that this is the pattern throughout the rest of the book of Acts. You can't miss it. Turn over in your Bible to chapter 4, verse 2. John and Peter are speaking to the people. The religious leaders hear about it. Chapter 4, verse 2. They were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people. Look ahead to verse 31 in chapter 4. After they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. Turn over to chapter 5, verse 19. Apostles have been put in jail, verse 19. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the doors of the jail and brought them out. Go stand in the temple courts, he said, and tell the people the message of this new life. One more, verse 42, same chapter. Day after day in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stopped 
teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Christ. So, have you got the picture? The miracle of Pentecost is that the Holy Spirit comes and God's people speak God's word to the nations of God's world. And that is how God gathers scattered people and gives them hope and a future. It's what church is all about. Sadly, uh, on the day of Pentecost, to the people who were there, it was all very confusing, chapter 2, verse 12. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them and said they've had too much wine. It's interesting that, isn't it? You know, when the first church was founded, people were already making fun of it. So let's not expect anything different today. But Peter takes their confusion with the greatest seriousness. And in the second half of our text, he provides the explanation, or if you like, the meaning of Pentecost in verses 14 to 21. See, if we're right in saying that the miracle of Pentecost begins the age when God's word is to go out throughout the world, the obvious question, the obvious question is who's going to do it? Who is going to do it? I mean, can the world be reached by professional ministers and clergy? Well, you know it can't. I mean, if you leave it entirely to clergy and people who've had formal training at Bible college, it's not going to happen because the task is too big. Now, that actually was the dilemma in the minds of Peter's Jewish audience. Uh, the Jews and uh, even the early Jewish Christians, they really battled with this. They found it hard to grasp that they were meant to be a missionary body of people. I mean, there are a few hints about that in the Old Testament. So there's dear old Jonah going off to Gentile Nineveh, and in the end they repented. And, of course, you know, there are examples of Jesus doing it, aren't there? He, he does ministry to the Samaritan woman at the well, John 4, and the uh, Syrophoenician woman, Mark 7. But you need to know that for the first Christians... The mission to the Gentiles was very hard to believe and even harder to act on. Just to make the point, turn over please to Acts 10, chapter 10, verse 45. Acts 10, verse 45. This is the um, account of the conversion uh, of a man called Cornelius who was a Roman centurion, and therefore he was a Gentile. We'll pick it up at verse 44. While Peter was speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. The circumcised believers, that is to say Jewish Christians, who'd come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles. Do you like that word, even? You know, the Jewish Christians were amazed. What, even on people like that? You can't be serious. What it's telling us is that there was this tremendous reluctance in uh, the early church to take the good news outside the family. You know, they saw the gospel as God's gift to Israel. Now, think about that, because it's absolutely no different today. You know, there is this sense, isn't there, in many churches that, you know, when we study God's Word together on Sunday mornings or in the home group, that this is for us. It's members only. That's what we think. We've missed the point. And that's the issue that Peter's addressing in Acts 2. Please come back there now. So, Peter, please will you tell us, how is God going to reach the world with the gospel? Verse 17. 
Peter says, in the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. So here is the meaning of Pentecost. We've spoken about the miracle. The meaning of Pentecost is that every believer becomes a teacher. Someone who tells other people the story of Jesus and his great love for men and women. Um, I should say that these verses don't mean God gives the gift of prophecy, visions, and dreams to everybody today. You know, these words come out of the Old Testament. Uh, They were the normal channels of revelation because in the Old Testament, uh, God revealed his plans and purposes to prophets, priests, and kings in prophecy, visions, and dreams. Now, of course, occasionally, just occasionally, God might still do the same thing today. Uh, I've spoken to you a number of times about my dear friend Vijay, who wrote the little booklet Raymond was talking about. When he was converted from Hinduism in his early 30s, God did give him dreams for a short time, um, which explained the essential truths of the Christian faith to a mind that had known absolutely nothing of these things. But, after a few weeks, the dream stopped. And from that time on, B.J. had to go to the Bible to understand the gospel. So we're not limiting God. You know, in special circumstances, God sometimes does reveal things to people in dreams. But they're not God's normal method of revelation. And what Peter's saying is that God reveals his truth to all believers and he's just using the language of the Old Testament to get his message across. He's quoting Joel. Joel was an Old Testament prophet. What other language did he have to use? So Peter's saying that rather than just a handful of prophets, priests and kings having the truth revealed to them, In the last days, the truth of the gospel is revealed to all believers, not just a few exceptionally gifted Christians who prophesy, every Christian. Therefore, that means, are you awake? All of you prophesy, if you're a Christian, which defines what prophecy actually means. It means that you are capable of telling the truth about Jesus because God has revealed it to you. It's not a gift that's just given to some. It's given to everybody, every Christian. You can't actually be a Christian without doing this. Notice in passing, the gift is given to sons and daughters. What a revolution. It means women as well as men a part of this great army of people who go out to the world with the gospel. It's also given to young and old. You don't have to have been a Christian for decades. Be a young convert, young adult. Go and tell the gospel. Mark Dever um, is the pastor of a very large church in Washington, D.C. And one of the things they do there is they teach their children... A catechism. We learned a catechism here last year, didn't we? What fun that was. We must do it again. A catechism is a summary of gospel truth which you learn by heart. It might be a sentence like this. There is no God but one. He alone is God. Salvation is found in no one else. And Mark Dever uh, tells a story of an experience that one of the young boys had at his school young boys in his church. Uh, The teacher in the school was a liberal, and on one occasion this teacher stood up in the school assembly and said to the children, it doesn't matter what you believe because all roads lead to heaven. God is who you think he is. 
there is no such thing as absolute truth. Whereupon this little boy stood up in front of the entire school and said, excuse me, miss, but that is not right. And then he recited the catechism word for word. Now, friends, that is just one example of what we're being told about here in Acts chapter 2. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people and they will prophesy. Now, that's what that little boy was doing. Incidentally, uh, that word pour out is used elsewhere of a torrential rainstorm. Uh, It's the kind of downpour that even though the distance from your car to your front door is only three feet, you get absolutely drenched. That's the idea here. God says, I'm going to drench my people with my spirit. Which means that once we become truly regenerate Christians, we know the great secret of God's love for us in Jesus Christ and his death for our sin. We know what the good news is and we're able to pass it on to others. You know, the task is enormous, but the task force is equally enormous. So that's the meaning of Pentecost. The ministry that Pentecost brings into the world is the capacity of all Christian people to go to all their neighbors and friends and even to the farthest corners of the world and tell them the good news of Jesus Christ. And uh, if that is what you want to do, if you're feeling a stirring in that direction this morning, the Holy Spirit is at work in your life. If this makes absolutely no sense at all, well, that may be a sign that there is no work of the Holy Spirit in your life. And today would be a very, very good day indeed for you to ask God to help you repent and trust in Christ so that you can receive the Holy Spirit. If you want to do that, it would be my privilege to pray with you after the service. But for those of you who are feeling the nudge, the push, the impulse of Pentecost this morning, why don't you speak to Raymond and Alita, Brenda, Alice, Michael, and ask them a bit more about what they told us earlier in Family Focus. But for now, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, we love this great chapter. We thank you that when the Holy Spirit came at Pentecost, that the gospel was spoken by many people and has been spoken by countless generations of believers ever since. Thank you for those who first brought the message to us. Thank you for their faithfulness and courage. And we ask that we might continue what they did. And we ask that as we preach and teach in the power of the Spirit, that we might see victories for Jesus in our nominal and dry culture. And we pray for Christ's sake. Amen.